as Sam said, I am the executive director of the State Libertarian Party of Indiana. Uh, I've been in this position for three and a half years. Before that, I was the morning show producer and reporter for News Talk 1430 WXNT in Indianapolis. And before that, I was a Republican. And we all do things in college that we're not proud of, but that was one of them. Uh, so, believe it or not, I've been involved in politics for about 10 years now. And when you've been involved in politics that long, that's how you end up a libertarian. So, uh, um, each, each of our guests today got a packet. And I'm going to talk about what's in the packet. You probably already have looked through it a little bit. And take you through some campaign finance issues. I'm going to focus on state. So I know we have one federal candidate, and that's a totally different animal. And I wanted to talk about We'll talk about how to get on the ballot. Um, I won't cover really any federal stuff because my best advice for federal candidates is you can't coordinate with state candidates and find a good treasurer that will read the campaign man the campaign finance guide, which I have a copy of over there that you can look at. I've read it thoroughly. Then you're good to go. That's all you need to know. Uh, really. Campaign finance, I know there's a lot of paperwork in here, and there's a lot of paperwork stacked up over there, and it seems intimidating, but it's really not. It's just putting your address and your phone number down about 100 times. Other than that, it's not that hard. Uh, I do want to give you the disclaimer that even though, as my wife often tells me, I'm not always right. Uh, I am the executive director of the state party. I'm not a lawyer, so you always should uh, take the advice of an election lawyer over myself or your best bet is to make friends with the Indian Election Division and your county clerk and discuss these, some of these campaign finance and ballot access issues with them. A lot of times county clerks, they're new every four to eight years and they don't understand libertarians at all. So when you have issues, I, I'm going to walk through the process of getting on the ballot and filling out your forms today. If what I tell you conflicts with what your clerk tells you, call me and I will talk to your county clerk, okay? Because oftentimes they think that we're a political action committee and they don't recognize us as a legitimate political party in Indiana because they don't know any better. So if you have conflicting information, call me, ask, ask a question. Don't make assumptions of any type. Call and ask. My phone number is in these packets and on the website about 100 times and we'll walk, walk you through that process of getting everything taken care of. But that being said, so, and I forgot to turn off my cell phone, so please make sure you turn off your cell phones and quiet those. Um, there are, I'm gonna start walking you through this document right here. It says Indiana Quick Guide. We have several quick guides on our website. If you go to lpin.org, it will. It is the hub for Libertarian Party politics in Indiana. You can find the LP 101 site, which is our website that we've put together that explains the basics of libertarian thought and the political philosophy in which this party was founded. It also leads you to the Libertarian Training Center. LibertarianTrainingCenter.com is a resource that I've put together <coughs> that has several manuals, it has all of these documents, it has uh, probably more information than you will be able to read in the next six to nine months, and, it, and it's all there, especially the slide share page that has 44 manuals uh, that you can walk through, and let me kind of show you that. So if, if you miss anything that I've said today, or you think back and you go, I wish I'd heard that, <coughs> we're going to film every one of the segments today and put them up on our YouTube page so you can go back and refer to these and that way people who couldn't be here in person today will also get the benefit of the training. So this is, uh, Jerry, it's not working. Um, yeah, try it, Chris. Uh, like this, get left or right. Just drag it, click and hold. It's an extended desktop. Uh, oh, I see, hold on. Sorry, guys. There you go. Okay. So this is our website, lpin.org, has a lot of resources. Sign up for our Liberty Beacon, connect with us on Facebook or Twitter, 
find us on YouTube. And in these modules here, you can find uh, lpstuff.com where you can get uh, Libertarian Party uh, video gear. You can find the Libertarian Training Center and the LP 101 <coughs> site as well as news. And let me click through to the Libertarian Training Center site. We did one of these classes in 2010, or late 2009 actually, and we have that up online on our YouTube page as well, and we also have it as an audio podcast, and we'll do the same for this. Uh, so that will eventually come up. So, so let's start <coughs> talking about how to get on the ballot. Libertarians are different than Republicans or Democrats. The way that Indiana election law works, it's, it's very Noah's Ark. It marches two by two by two by two. And they design everything for Republicans and Democrats, Republicans and Democrats. And then when we come along and mess up the system, it frustrates county clerks and sometimes even our candidates. The, the way that it works is everything is set on the Secretary of State's race. When a political party achieves 2% in the Secretary of State's race, and we achieved 6% with my query in 2010, that gives a political party ballot access automatically for four years. All right, so the Republicans, the Democrats, and the Libertarians have automatic ballot access. When you hit 10% of the vote, then you have, uh, you participate in the primaries in May. All right, that is closed party business. And this always sort of annoys libertarians when they first hear it, because they think that the May primaries are a general election. That's closed party business. And when you go in and pull the R or the D ballot in the May primary, you are certifying, uh, certifying under the threat of perjury that you intend to vote for the majority of that party's candidates in November. Okay? So... I don't want to know if you vote for Ron Paul in the primaries, don't, <laughs> don't tell me. Uh, that's that's your, your option, but that is the case. So how do the Libertarians select their candidates if we don't participate in the primaries like the other parties do? We have nominating conventions. That's not paid for by the taxpayers. We have delegates at our, our state convention, which will be coming up, and you have the information on the little cards that I gave you. Uh, we have delegates that are selected at each county that go to the state convention and they then select the candidates for nomination. Uh, so that, that, is a, that is a main difference. If you're running for a local office, you will get selected or elected by your local conventions, your county convention. So let's say you're running for Hendricks County Commissioner. You would get selected as a candidate, or elected as a candidate, I'll use that interchangeably, uh, at the Hendricks County Convention. Let's say you live in Whitley County where we don't have an affiliated party. Then that means that your candidacy for Whitley County Commissioner would go to the state party convention. Okay, so there is a difference. And I'm gonna move through some of this stuff and I'll, I'll take questions later. I know that it can get a little convoluted, but it's, uh, important to understand how we go through this process. Uh, I've written out the entire process for getting on the ballot on this quick guide that's a single sheet. It should be the second after the, the longer explanation. And just an explanation of this first document, this is a guide that I wrote up to kind of walk you through the process. And if you go to... Uh, If you go to lpin.org and you go to free resources, I have given you a link to the training center and the slide share page. Uh, documents such as how the, the state parties organized, uh, state officer duties, a donation card, some outreach pieces, some signs, how to canvas for votes. Uh, this is for county affiliation and also candidate resources. Everything in your packet today is available online as well. I've written out the entire candidate process, the entire county process. I've assembled all the documents you're gonna need and I've put them on the resources page online, as well as high resolution LPI and images and some research for federal and state candidates. So that is a very helpful page for you to know about. 
Uh, and even for federal candidates, they, we have the disclosure forms and some other things. Uh, so anything I talk about today, you're going to be able to refer back to that page and find these documents. And this walks you through those documents. There is even a zip file package that if you click on this, it will download the entire package that I handed out today online. So all the PDFs, Word documents, all that is available online. And this walks you through that, kind of walks you through some of what I'm going to be talking about today. So just to review over this document, uh, the broad view of the process is that we're a minor political party compared to the other two. Political parties like the Constitution Party and the Green Party and the budding Tea Party in Indiana don't have ballot access because they haven't reached 2% in the Secretary of State's race, which roughly translates to 30,000 Hoosiers voting for a Secretary of State candidate. We had 100,000 vote for Mike Weary, our soon-to-be Secretary of State. So, um, I gotta say, going to the Secretary of State's website last night to look for some of these documents again, it was really satisfying not to see his name on that website again. <laughs> uh, the candidates will then go uh, before the conventions. Our rules are written out in our bylaws. So the state party and county parties write out the rules for nominating and electing candidates in their bylaws. Uh, it is, we are a private organization. The Republicans and the Democrats are a private organization. They just participate in public elections. So we, as a private organization, write out our own rules and, and uh, work on those bylaws at conventions. If you m are watching this or if you don't get to a convention and you can't get on the ballot, then we can fill a vacancy. So let's say we have House District 1, Congressional District 1, we don't have a candidate that's nominated at the state convention. Well, after our state convention, that means we have a vacancy. We have no one running for that office. We can then go back and we have until July, uh, June 30th to appoint a vacancy. County chairs can appoint a vacancy for a particular office after their convention. So we have until June 30th, realistically, to continually re recruit candidates. There are, there are some deadlines, and this is more for county chairs and state chairs. You'll see July 15th and July 16th in the campaign finance documents. Well, technically that is right. Ignore that. June 30th is the last day to turn in paperwork if you're putting people on the ballot. After you've been nominated and elected at the convention, how do we tell, if we don't participate in a primary, how do we tell the county clerk of the state election board that you're our candidate? Well, that goes to the left side of your page, the CAN 22 or the CAN 23. This is the county chairman and secretary or the state chairman and secretary certifying that you are our candidate for the office you are seeking. Okay? This first page, and this first page is your responsibility to fill out correctly. If you don't fill it out correctly, then you're not going to get on the ballot. We will, as the secretary and the state chair or county chair sign it, and I get it, the three of us will look at it for mistakes. I had one instance where the guy didn't fill it out correctly in 2010. I repeatedly mailed, emailed, and called him. He never got back to me. He didn't get on the ballot. He ended up getting fined because he thought because he wasn't on the ballot, his campaign was closed. Well, that isn't how it works. So it was sort of a cluster. So I didn't give you the second sheet yet just because I was trying to save on paper. And it's not something that you need at this point. This is going to be taken care of a lot longer down the road here. But I wanted you to be aware that there are two sheets to this. And you can, again, find that document on the website here. And it's basically your name and this box here on your CAN 23 and CAN 22. And let me clarify, 23 is for state legislative, statewide, or federal offices. CAN 22s are for anything local, like county commissioner, town clerk, for instance, okay? But they're pretty much interchangeable as far as how the documents are laid out. So this is how your name will appear on the ballot. And so if you're going to use a nickname like Ron Happy Sincush, all right, it would go Ron, 
quotation marks, Pappy Sinkush. Okay, it's Ron Pappy Sinkush Jr. in case there's a Pappy Senior. All right, there are some nicknames that are not allowed. And it could, if you put those nicknames on here, get you thrown off the ballot. Uh, for instance, we had someone run in 2010 that ran as so-and-so, doc, so-and-so. Well, doc could be short for doctor, okay? You can't run as Ron Sergeant Sinkush or Ron Detective Sinkush because that shows that you have a standing in the community and they don't want you, your name on the ballot to get a higher standing than other candidates. Does that make sense? So doc shows that you're a doctor, which means you may be more uh, elite, for lack of a better word, than, than the other candidates. Uh, to be sure, and once this fires back up, every qualification for every office and some of the information for what nicknames are or are not allowed are right here in the 2012 Candidates Guide. Okay? If you're running for an office and you don't know what the government's qualifications for that office are, you need to go look at the Candidates Guide and learn those qualifications. Okay, in, at the state level, you can't be a felon. If you have a felony, you can't run for a state office. True to form, you can run for a federal office if you have a felony. Okay, so that is allowed. Uh, residency, I don't know if residency counts, but those are, those are also included in that document. So the candidate's guide lays out the requirements and also lays out the process. The campaign finance manual lays out the specific campaign rule, finance rules for your election, okay? These are 100 pages each. You're only gonna have to read about 10 to 15 of them, each guide, all right? So it's a really easy read. Take a half an hour, read both of them. You will be all the better. Uh, so it's just the name that will appear on the ballot, your information, your residency information. It's funny how the word residency appeared on this document uh, over the last year. Candidate certification, campaign finance information, it looks like you know, it's just the candidate signing this side. And then this is where the state or county chairman signs and the secretary of science. We as a party turn these in for you. Uh, sometimes we will give you the document and just have you turn it in depending on where you're at. If you're in, we have Dan Stevens, I don't know if Dan's here today, in Kosciuszko County, I email those to forms to him, he takes care of it. Uh, in some cases, I take them to the state house for you. Uh, so let's go to the next part. So that's how you're put on the ballot, all right? We have, we're gonna talk about LPIN qualifications first, and then we're going to talk about campaign finance. All right, so here's ours, and here's theirs. So just to be clear, so it, this is a form that we're, we're implementing new this year. Uh, one of the things, this is the an application for nomination at the annual convention of the LPIN. It's a three-page form. And the Central Committee met in November. And one of the things that we've learned over the last few years is that we need to standardize some procedures. And one of the things that we need to standardize is how, not, how candidates are selected and vetted. And one of the ways that we are selecting and vetting, because there are a lot of you that I just met for the first time today. Maybe we're Facebook friends, but we've never really talked in person. And probably most of the leadership hasn't met you and talked to you before. Uh, so we want to make sure that if you are carrying our banner as a libertarian, that you do fit within our ideology. Not that you're at the a top of the diamond 100-100 libertarian. It's not, it's not a purity test. But if you're going out and advocating for certain things that are just so unlibertarian that our delegates would not want to elect you, then they need to know that. So this is our vetting form that we're introducing this year. And it's, we have some new qualifications that we're, we're asking of candidates, in fact, demanding. Um, you have to complete this form to be brought up at the state convention. It's up to each county whether or not they want to introduce it. Yes, sir. Um, there's access to fill this out online, correct? 
There is a Word document that you can download here. And if you want, if you filled out the National Party's Run for Office form, I can forge you that email and you can copy and paste. It just that's almost appears like I filled out this application online the sure. other day. And that's something that we're going to talk about later. How do we want to make you not do double duty? But I, I can forward that email back to you and you can redo it. Um, the difference being is that when you fill out that run for office form, that's sort of your first contact to us. And I, I see you, Greg. I'll get back there in just a minute. When, when you fill out that form, that's like the first time you're telling us that you want to run. We talk to you, we walk you through some of these processes. You may decide that you don't want to run and you don't want to go through the process. Or you decide that you do want to go through the process and you do want to run. Well, I don't want to put you forth at the state convention without knowing your firm commitment. And that's why we're asking for the second, the second form, okay? And I can make it easy on you and send that back to candidates who fill out that first form so you can kind of copy and paste. But does that make sense? I mean, that's why sure. there, there's, there's, it seems like double duty, but there is some reasoning behind that. Um, but that's something that we're going to talk about clarifying tomorrow, because this is a new process, and we want to make it easier. Sam. Sure, so I also want to point out to people that there are questions on that form that the national application to run for office does not have, right. such as have you ever been convicted of a felony? Um, and the other thing is that form asks a bunch of yes or no questions about various issues. On our form, we want a short narrative of your vision of that or your ideas about those issues. Just a couple sentences, two or three sentences. I mean, nothing. I mean, there are people who sent in four and a half pages on one issue, and it's like, man, <laughs> just briefly. So, to walk you through this form, uh, it's if it has a little R by it, it's, it's required. Um, anything that you don't want public, let me know. Okay, and I will make sure to ask people, do you, you want this public? We are asking candidates to provide a public email and phone number and possibly an address. I always recommend just getting a Google number because then that will satisfy both the email and the phone number requirement because it's always frustrating for media and voters when they go to the LPN's website and we have 42 emails and phone numbers, but then the candidate they're looking for is the one that doesn't have the phone number. And if you're running a campaign that's worth noticing, you're going to have a public email and phone number. I mean, that's just the honest truth. Uh, and you know, some previous political experience, uh, a convicted of a crime, that's the felony. Uh, just asking, is there anything embarrassing in your past that might embarrass the LP? Okay, uh, everybody's got skeletons in their closet, you know, even Sam, our state chairman, I'm sure. Uh, so it's, it's just one of those things that if you come to us asking for our ballot access and to carry our banner as a party, this is an organization where you just one individual can hurt the entire image of the party. And when you're elected by our delegates, it's important for them to know that you're going to carry the banner well. All right, so if just talk to me about it. We don't, I mean, if you put it down on the form, if you have any reservations about some of that stuff, have a conversation with me and, and we'll talk about it, okay? Just a second. Just sure. Um, next is what office will you be seeking? Have you filled out any of the forms we're talking about today? We do ask that any state legislative, statewide, or federal candidate get a headshot a short biography, and the promise that you'll put together a website for us, which I can help with, okay? We can help you put together a basic website. The reason being is the last two election cycles, about October, the media starts paying attention to our candidates. They call me at 10 in the morning and they say, hey, uh, I haven't gotten this headshot and this biography from this candidate, and I've got a deadline of noon and I need a headshot and a biography right now. And then I try to get a hold of you, and then it's, it just makes both the party and yourself look bad when I have to say to a member of the media or a local group, I'm sorry they don't have a headshot, or they don't have a biography. And then they always go, well, that's really lame. <laughs> so it's, it's better just to go to J.C. Penney's, spend five bucks, get the headshot, and send it in, and you're good. And if you're in the Indianapolis area, a, we have several photographers that uh, 
can take the picture, or even if you have a nice camera, put on a suit and sit in front of the curtains and get a picture taken. Just something that's presentable that we, that if you opened up the newspaper and you saw a candidate running for office, you look at them and they're wearing like a tuxedo t-shirt, that's not a good headshot, okay? Something presentable. You're, you're in essence, when you're running for office, interviewing for a job. So you wouldn't walk in in a tuxedo t-shirt or a Slayer t-shirt or something along those lines. So, uh, so the other part of it is the website. That's just, at this point, it, it could be a Facebook page, even in my mind. I think that a static website that explains some of your positions. Again, it's like a resume, like you're running for a job. People want to know where you stand on, if you're running for a state office, where do you stand on right to work? If you're running for a federal office, where do you stand on Obamacare? And you're going to get a couple hundred hits on that website the month before the election. And people want to know that basic information. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard over the last 10 years, I'm voting for this, even though I'm a Republican, I'm voting for the Democrat because the Democrat at least had enough, put forth enough effort to put a, together a website. I mean, people, even something as small as that, they, that will change their vote. And there are people who, you know, most times because libertarians are more techno technologically savvy, we're the ones with the website and the other two don't. So that's an advantage for us. It's a way to promote the libertarian philosophy, the party, and most of all your candidacy. And explain what libertarians believe to voters. Uh, another part is who will be nominating you at the state convention. When we bring you forth at the state convention or the local convention, you are nominated by someone. Uh, and that could be the next part of this. Right? This is where the vetting comes in. Okay, it's not just the form. The form will be made available to delegates at the state convention. Okay, so I want you to be aware that this is, this is not public. It's not going to be on our website, all of this information. But we are going to make available to our voters at the, at the delegations these forms so that they have uh, a chance to look at some of your views, and talk to you about some of those views. Uh, in the past, you know, we haven't been as tight, and we've we need to tighten up, and we need to put our best face forward, and this is part of that process. So the other thing that's required is you have to get two signatures from elected party leadership. I do not count. I'm not elected. I'm a paid employee. A, an elected leadership, a member of leadership, is a county chair or a state central committee member. Raise your hand if you're a uh, county chair or an SEC member. One, two, three, four, five, six are in this room today. And that's pretty common. So you could get this form after they have a conversation with you. And it's called the vouch system. So if you go and talk to Jerry, Jerry's going to have a couple questions for you, knowing Jerry. And the long time LP <coughs> members are smiling because they know Jerry's going to want to know where you stand on a couple issues. And so will any other member of elected leadership. They're going to have a couple questions for you. And you don't have to agree with them on 100% of the stuff. And I, don't, I know most of our leadership, they're not going to demand that you're lockstep with them. They're going to say, well, I think you're wrong about that, but all right, I'll sign your form, okay? But if you come up and you say, I love Obamacare. I think every person, we should have socialized medicine. You're not getting this form signed. And we don't want you carrying our banner as a congressional candidate if you're arguing for Obamacare. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so that's, that's part of this vouch system. We have on our website, if you, uh, let's see here. You scroll up, you go to contact, and you drop down and it says county parties. There's probably about 50 or 60 names and phone numbers and emails on that website that you can call and talk to. And we're going to have several events uh, between now and then where you, can, where you can talk to people and get some of that, that stuff. It's, it's not hard. It's, just, it's a small amount of effort that I think that if you're going to run a good campaign, you're going to make that effort to reach out to elected leadership and talk to them about your positions. Uh, and then you fix your signature saying that to the best of your knowledge, the information is right. And then here's just some issues. You don't have to write a magnum opus, a couple sentences, you know, I mean, gun laws, I believe in the Second Amendment. You know, that's kind of vague, so try to give us a little more than I believe in the Second Amendment because sometimes you never know. But 
Uh, again, it's, it's not a litmus test, it's not a purity test, it's just a little bit to know where you stand. So we're giving our voters at our conventions the information that they need to make a good selection. How am I doing on time, by the way? About 15 minutes left. Okay, that's perfect. I'm right on schedule. All right, so that's this form. That is, that is the qualification within the party. You've got to meet the requirements for the office. You've got to uh, just do a couple basic things so when the media calls and asks for information, we're prepared. I'm very big on being prepared, obviously. I mean, this prepares you. I want you to have, I want to make it easy on you and our leadership and get you prepared. And by asking you to do these basic things early, then it's not going to become a giant headache later. All right, so wasn't a Boy Scout, but it might have been. So let's, let's move on to the financial stuff. Or let's move on to actually the CFA 1. Chris, I think somebody had a question. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, correct. That's okay. Um, and, found the answer in the application. All right, yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, you answered it basically. I, I was wondering if um, we need an extra sheet for this. It, there is a Word document that, I, I mean, frankly, I'd probably rather you go to the website, grab the Word document, and type it out, and then maybe, you know, fax and scan back. Or if you need to write on the back, go ahead. I mean, try to be legible. So don't try to rig the system by writing like a doctor or anything. So, uh, so yeah, either way, we've got a PDF, and we've got these printed out for you today. Or you can go use the Word document and type it to your heart's content. Brief. Brief. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Box. <laughs> uh, I don't have a CFA one, so if you let me grab one here. This is the candidate's statement of organization. All right, so you have there's two views of a candidate under Indiana election law. All right. The first is the candidate as a person on the ballot, a political entity. And then there is a candidate as a monetary entity, as a fiscal entity. All right, so there's two forms that deal with that. There is the CFA-1 and the CFA-4. The CFA-1 is your statement of organization. You become a candidate. Under Indiana law, there's two ways you become a candidate. If you stand up in front of the room today and you say, I declare myself as a candidate for House District 92, that could be considered a declaration of candidacy and you have 10 days to fill this out and send it into the State House, to the Indiana Election Division. The other definition of a candidate is if you raise and or spend a combined $100 in which you have to fill out the CFA-1 and you have to declare that on your CFA 4, okay? Uh, I don't consider showing up to a candidate training session today saying I'm thinking about running for this office as a declaration. But if you create a website, that could be viewed as a declaration of candidacy, okay? So if you've done that already, don't freak out if you haven't filled out this paperwork. Uh, you just want to get it in as soon as possible, okay? So, it, it's sort of, when you fill out this form, it's sort of like creating a business in some ways, okay? You're creating a separate entity from yourself, all right? That's how I often try to refer to it, so people kind of think about it. It's, it's not you, it's now an organization, all right? And this form tells the government the Indiana Election Division or your county clerk that you are a candidate for office. So it's pretty simple. Uh, just to walk through some of the, I'm going to look down at it uh, so if you <coughs> the document with me. The, obviously your first one, you will not have a file number and this won't be an amendment and it will be your principal committee. If you're thinking about running for office and you want to put up a website and float the idea of you running, like for instance, Rupert Bonham did that when he declared that he was thinking of running for governor. He filed an exploratory committee, not a principal campaign committee. Okay, because he hadn't yet made the decision to run, 
but he wanted to publicly talk about himself running for office. So he filed an exploratory committee. Uh, obviously, you'd be affiliated as a libertarian, and you want to, on line 12, talk about the office sought. Uh, the full name of the committee in line 13 is, you know, Hoosiers for Jeremiah Morrill, or committee to elect Ron Sinkush. You know, something basic along those lines. Excuse me. Uh, the campaign chairperson, when you fill out this form, you need a candidate, a chairperson, and a treasurer. The candidate can be the treasurer and the chairperson. Okay? A person can be the chairperson of many different committees. Uh, but there is a rule that I'm desperately trying to quickly remember about uh, being the I don't think a person can be the chairperson and the treasurer at the same time. Unless uh, it's the candidate. Uh -huh. Unless it's the candidate. Right, right. So your mom, you are the candidate. Your mom can't be the chairperson and the treasurer. Okay? But oftentimes, unless you're running a really uh, vigorous race where you're planning on raising a ton of money, then I would get a treasurer. But in some cases, it's just easier to make sure that you get out the Excel spreadsheet, keep track of what you raise and spend, and then you file the reports. Okay? Uh, now, don't shake your head in agreement because it's different with federal candidates. So, <laughs> it's, it's, everything's wacky on the federal level because they're in charge of it. That's why they broke it. Uh, so, I, would, I usually recommend to people, be your own chairperson and treasurer. Okay? Because we had one instance where one of our candidates recently appointed a good friend to treasurer, and the person fell off the face of the earth, got embarrassed that they fell off the face of the earth and cost this person some fines, and their friendship is over basically because this person cost the candidate $1,500. So, you know, make sure that this person is trustworthy, that you're going to be able to maintain contact with them, and consistent contact, okay? Because if you don't fill out these forms right, and just pay attention to what you're doing, it can cost you money. You're not going to go to jail most of the time. Uh, make sure you live where you say you live. Uh, but you need to be on the ball. Yes, sir. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, at, at any point you can basically appoint a new treasurer correct. or chairman. Correct. That's why there is a box on line one that says, is amendment. this an amendment? So let's say your treasurer is non existent. Go in and fill out the paperwork and put it in and uh, appoint a new treasurer. Uh, you got, oh, uh, you know, so walk through here and make sure that people sign every line. Sometimes people forget on line 32 to have both people sign that, as well as line 41. People sometimes forget to fill out those two lines, and that will mean that they won't accept it, which could cause you to be fined. Okay, or at the very least, it could cause you to have, uh, it's another day I gotta go down to the county courthouse. Or another day I gotta make Spangle walk over to the state house, or I've gotta drive to the state house. Okay, so, and when you're filing this stuff, I will, I will not guarantee that I will help you by walking over to the state house. I've got a lot of work that I've gotta get done. I have a schedule that I keep. There are times where I try to be flexible and help our candidates by because you're in Angola and you need this filed at the state house and it just doesn't make sense, you know. But work with me. Give me some lead time and I, I will help you file some of this stuff. Uh, yes, sir. You can use fax machine as well. You don't have to. And, and that and fax machines is exactly right. I'm not responsible for your documents. I'm here to consult with you and help you with the process. I'm not here to do for you. Okay. But I am a resource that's there to help you out. Yes, sir. I just want to add from experience, you also want to fax it the, with the right side up. <laughs> because if you accidentally fax it with the blank side and you don't find out until the next day, that's a $50 fine. That is, that is the biggest lesson from 2010. After you fax something in, that was me. call and ask a question. <laughs> I had six people who faxed something in who faxed it upside down or they faxed it and it got attached to somebody else's CFA4, and then they're all mad at me, they're all mad at the election division. Well, a simple follow-up phone call to Abby or Michelle over at the IED 
will go a long way or to your county clerk. Beth? I think the state will let you just fax it right to them. Right. That's they what you should do. No, I don't want, don't I don't have a fax machine. Uh, let me make that clear. I don't have a fax machine. Fax it to the IED. I mean, I, there are times where there are pinches where I'm downtown, I work four blocks away where I will help you out, but you are responsible for filing. I will give you reminders, but this thing right here is your lifesaver. Put it on your fridge, learn it, love it, follow it, all right? And that is the reporting calendar thing for the CFA 4s. So we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Yes, Greg? The CFA 1, mm -hmm. you can file that before the state convention, right? Sure can. And that uh, really the, starts your, if you got, I've got a candidate that's wanting to get started right now ahead of our convention, <coughs> I should be filling one of these out at this time, is that correct? Is there anybody in here who has filled this out other than, I know Jeremiah has, anybody, Ron, do you have a committee open? James, okay. I, I actually filed an independent exploratory. Okay. We'll take you out back later. No, I don't. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you can file this at any time. File it today. I mean, get get going, get started. I mean, or wait until the convention. I mean, if you file it today, you have to be aware that you will have to file paperwork. And you need, when you file your committee, you need to write down two things or keep a copy of your committee name and the date your uh, organization was opened, which is right down here. That's the date that your organization began. Because you're going to have to write that down on your CFA 4, okay? Uh, but you shouldn't be doing anything, collecting funds or anything, until you just fill out one of these CF1s, right? No, no, I mean, you, if, you're, if you're to the point where you're raising money actively, you need to file your CFA 1 and you need to follow the proper procedures. All right, so you filled this out, you're, you're a candidate. All right, so what's your next step? Uh, I would hope that you're raising money because you're going to need money for cool things like this stuff. All right, I have given you some examples of materials that previous campaigns have used. We've got some yard sign uh, examples over here. We've got uh, more materials back there to ch check out. Anybody can take some of that, uh, some, there's stacks of 100 of the door hangers and you can take as many of those as you want. Uh, I've got like another 3,000 in my office and I'm sure Central Committee has about 7,000 in their car today too to get rid of. Uh, so there's, you know, you've got your polyboard signs, you've got your uh, corrugated signs, you've got your bag signs, you know, those, the Victoria Foley, Rebecca Sink Burris, those signs were I think $2 a piece with wires. You know, so if you want 500 signs, it's two dollars a piece. That's a thousand bucks. You know, these we've got 5,000 of these for Rebecca printed at a, at a pop, and I think it was 50 to 100 bucks for a case of 5,000 of these. Those postcards that we just had printed uh, at GotPrint.com, uh, those are generally around 20 bucks, but we had them rushed a little bit. You know, just even something simple like this, where if you're going to a parade, this is an example of a county party using a candidate to promote an event and to get the message out to a certain group of people at, at an event. Activism, which is something that he'll be talking about later. So, you know, that, that costs money to go to, that costs eight cents to go to Staples and get printed off, or $60 for a laser toner. You know, Phil Miller had a great piece where he said, why am I running, had his logo, had the world's smallest political quiz on there. I don't know how much he spent on, on these, to be honest. Gotprint.com is a great place to get some of these things printed. Uh, those signs were done at Capital Promotions. Uh, and I, I'm going to have a vendor's list, a preferred vendor's list. I just got swamped this week, so I'm going to have it up on those websites for you. You know, these things cost money, and these are very <coughs> basic. And if you're running for office and you go to a county fair and you don't have something to hand out, you're really going to regret it. I mean, you're going to feel like... Oh, I wish I had at least done something simple like this. I mean, plan ahead. Don't show up with a, a piece of paper with, you know, you just text on it. Make it, find somebody in your world that's a graphic designer. I can even help, you know, if you give me some time, help create something for you using gotprint.com templates. I have some Illustrator software and you give me a headshot or a logo and some basic talking points, I'll help you design this stuff and then you pay to get it printed. All right, so I, I'm, I'm there to help with, with some of that basic stuff. Um, which, 
is also why we have these yellow cards. All this valuable experience, printed materials, and other things, this costs money, it costs time and effort, and that's why we're always wanting to raise more money to continue these great efforts. So take a look at the yellow cards. This is for the 1994 Society, which is our monthly contribution program, as well as uh, basic membership. You can sign up online or sign up today. So the last part I'm going to talk about is the CFA4. All right, and I have these CFA4s are 20 pages long. Okay, I've given you the top sheet because that's what you need today. All right, uh, and I also have some CFA5s and CFA11s. These are for large contributions. Anything over a thousand dollars you need to report immediately within certain time frames. For those specific reporting periods, check the campaign finance manual, but be aware of it, okay? That if you get anything over a thousand bucks, you've gotta make a special report on that. Uh, when you first file, yes, Greg? If you give money to your own campaign over a thousand bucks, do you have to fill out one of those? Yes, sir. You're, you, when you <laughs> file a campaign, when you create that CFA1, you are a, a separate legal entity, all right? You're still you, but you have this other entity. It's like being a small business owner. You're not your, unless you have, I think, what, an S corporation. You're not your business, for the most part, okay? And that's why I recommend going, just a second. That's why I recommend when you open your CFA1, if you intend on raising more than $20, go, go to the IRS website and file for an EIN number. Okay, that is like a social security number for your campaign. All right, we don't want you to use your personal social security number, especially, and as libertarians we abhor this, especially if you incur debt, okay? Uh, and if you go to the resources page, I've got the link up for, it's under county affiliation as well as under the candidates, you can apply for an EIN number. It takes like 10 minutes, it's very easy. Uh, then you go to a bank and you open up a business account with the bank. It, it can, it, you, you get the bright-eyed uh, clerk who doesn't understand what code to put in for your organization. So we use Fifth Third and usually they're pretty good about understanding uh, political organizations. But use, use your personal bank if you have a relationship. Just don't leave without a bank account. Sometimes they can be a little frustrated with that. But I would recommend filing for an EIN number, set up a bank account. Because when people give you money, they are giving you money to promote your cause. And they want to make sure, that's why you file these reports, to make sure that that money is spent wisely. You know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, help me out, discipleship. I mean, it's, it's just being a good steward, is what I'm trying to say, of, of the resources that are being given to you. And that's why they, the government asks you to fill out these papers. Uh, when you first file, let's say you're going to the state convention, you don't fill out your CFA-1, you don't fill out any paperwork. When you show up, you're going to bring, filled out a CFA-1, a CFA-4, but just the top page, okay? Because when you've not raised any money or spent any money, you just have a front page with all zeros, okay? And, and bring your CAN 22 or 23 for people to sign. And you know, again, it's not an amendment because it's your first one. You don't have a file number. Make sure you put the zeros in there. Full name of committee as on line 13 of your CFA-1. Party affiliation, office sought. Uh, again, it's just filling out your address another time. And check one. Is it pre-primary, pre-election, annual, nomination, other? Uh, I will... If you're running for office, I add you to a list, and I will list. I will tell you how to mark out your CFA one. So if it's post convention, then if it's your post convention report, then you'll write on the line eleven post convention, and you'll write nomination. Okay. So I will help you walk through some of that. If if you're on that email list, uh, make sure you ask me to be on that email list, please. Reporting periods. And filing dates are all on this sheet right here. This is your lifesaver. This is in the campaign finance <coughs> manual. That's why it says pages seven, eight, and nine. Uh, you can check that there. And it tells you 
you know, your pre-primary report is due 1, 1, 12 through 4, 30, 4, 13, 12. I'm reading upside down. Uh, that's the reporting period, and it's due by noon on this date. It's not closed business, it's noon. And if it's at 12.01 p.m., you are late and you got a $50 fine to pay, okay? They're, they're very much sticklers on that. So, you know, your first one will be all zero through here, your treasurer signs it, the candidate signs it, and then you turn that in, all right? As you walk through, if you wanna see the full form, you can walk through and this is where you itemize. Any contribution for state and local candidates over $100 must be itemized. If, let's say you have a fundraiser and someone walks up and gives you $99, you don't have to mark them down. You just say it's a miscellaneous contribution if, if in my opinion. Let's put that on there for Rutherford, okay? <laughs> our, our lawyer. Uh, if it's over $101, you've got to get their name and their address and make sure you write that down. This is this is, these forms are all for, uh, you know, walking through the itemizing and debts and things that are owed to the committee. Most of you are looking at me with glazed eyes. That's why you find a sucker, I mean treasurer, to do this for you, all right? So you can focus on the important stuff, which is talking to candidates, talking to the public, to, or talking to voters, not other candidates. Yes, sir. Chris, I don't know if you're planning on doing it, but you went over the campaign finance limits uh -huh. in Indiana. Yeah. For, not for federal candidates, but for candidates in Indiana. Go for it. Well, unless it's changed, there are no campaign finance limits in Indiana for you receiving as a candidate money from an individual. Right. The only limits are from a, a, a union or corporation. You can only receive $1,000, I'm sorry. Right. From a corporation or a union, right? Right. And tax is unlimited? Tax is limited, I think, to 5000 Well, not in the Coleman's game, game, game. Okay. Oh, no, so yeah, you're right, you're right. Game. That's on the national level, on the federal level. But no, it wouldn't run for federal. No, I'm for saying, uh, here, there is an unlimited. So if you want to give my campaign money as an individual, fellow Hoosier, unlimited amounts of money, okay, as an individual, as long as it's all documented, okay? If you're running for federal office, that's where the twenty the twenty five hundred dollars comes in. Okay, so there is an individual limit on the federal level. Corporations can't donate to federal candidates. Corporations can donate to state candidates. The thing about corporation donations is you're getting into bed with somebody in some corporation, and it could be an issue in the campaign. So, and, and it's the same with individuals. So you always need to be aware, especially the more effective you are the more they pick through these documents to try and get you. So I, again, I would have a, a treasurer read through these campaign finance documents and find out all the restrictions, but most of your donations will be smaller, one-timer repeating individual donations to your campaign. That is typically how it goes for libertarian candidates. Yes, sir. I also want to bring up a point. I, I was told um, that you really should write down the information on any donor, no matter the amount, because right. if they came back to you later, if they give you 60 bucks today and came back in two months and gave you another 60, that's now 120 that they've donated. And you have to report Each it. time didn't put them over the limit, mm -hmm. but the 120 did, and now you have to report that that it individual is an, gave it is an aggregated $100 dollars per year, okay? okay. And but so if you don't keep track of the small donation at, at first, you will. You may not know that you went over the limit later. Right. It's so. it's all aggregated in both right. federal and state. And uh, again, federal and state campaigns cannot coordinate. They can't trade money. They can't coordinate on events. State and federal by by both are are, are it just has to remain totally separate. So if you're a federal campaign, you can't campaign with a governor candidate. Okay. You can campaign all you want with other federal candidates or senate candidates. That's fine, because that's all federal. Um, the reason I can coordinate with both is because the LPIN, the state party, is a state party and a federal party, okay? But candidate campaigns are separated, all right? So it's an aggregated across the board. So if, it's, if, some, if your mom gives you 2,500 this year, that's it, she can't give you. If she gives you 2,000, she can only give you 500 more. All right, so it's not a one-time thing. Yes, sir. Uh, my question was, um, I guess it's from my understanding, you can actually take, um, 
like a, your own personal money and invest it in the campaign, mm -hmm. and then once you start to attain contributions, reimburse yourself. You, you must. You all right? That's. A, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, you can do that. You can. You have to when you give money to the campaign, and just like we talked about, with Greg you're subject to the same rules because you're an individual giving to that organization, okay? So even though it's your campaign. So the same rules for, uh, and I think individual candidates, there may be a different federal rule, but I've never been a treasurer for a federal campaign, uh, so I can't say that with accuracy. But you can give money to your own campaign, and if you want to get that money back, you must mark it as a loan to the campaign. Okay, if you mark it as a donation, then you're out of luck. You're not getting that money back. Okay, there are some instances where candidates can get paid, and they're, I think, online, uh, somewhere in the CFA 4, on line 31, it says you can be paid a salary. I never advise that. I think that's a dangerous precedent. I don't think you should pay yourself a salary if you're a candidate. I think it's a bad idea, and I'd never say go for it. Uh, Brett, then Joyce. Uh, you mentioned the $1,000 limit when there was something that you had to report within so many days or hours. Do you have that? I have those forms over there. I didn't pass those out because it's not, I don't want to be too overwhelming with the paperwork. Um, but it's the CFA 11 and CFA 5, if you want to take a look at those. Okay. Every piece of information, anytime you get a form, it comes with an explanation sheet. Okay, that's why there's 10 pages to the CFA 4 and there's 10 pages of explanation. That's why it's a 20 page document. All right, the goal here is not to confuse you or get you tripped up. It's to do right by the public, okay? Now, some people may, some libertarians may disagree with that, but that's just, these are the rules we gotta play by. All right, county clerks and the Indiana Election Division are there to help you. All right, and if you have questions, especially Michelle Thompson and Abby Taylor at the Indiana Election Division, two of the most helpful people on the face of the planet. And if you have an issue or you have a question, you can call in and ask them about the campaign finance forms and they'll help you. All right, you can ask me too. But your county clerk, most of the time you will find that your county clerk is very helpful because they, like everyone else at work, wants their day to go smoothly. The more problems, the more they take home with them and they don't want to do that. They want everything to go smoothly. So it's better to ask questions than sit there and have a, have a catastrophe afterwards. The last piece, are, are there any more questions before we move on? Yes, Joyce, I'm sorry. Could you maybe explain what in kind means? In kind, me. all right, thank you. In kind contributions. Let's say you have a friend that owns a print shop, all right, and or they're a graphic designer. And they're going to design this for you, okay? They can do that. Now, you have to find out whether they're going to use their personal time or their corporate time to do it, okay? Because if you're a federal candidate and their business is going to do free graphics work for you, can't do it because that would be an in-kind contribution from a corporation and you can't take contributions from a corporation, okay? So if my sister, knows graphic design and is going to design this card for me, and that's roughly a $200 project on the fair market, of the fair market value, I write that down as, a, as an in-kind contribution on the forms. Okay, does that make sense? You're not paying her $200, but she's doing $200 worth of work for you for free. All right, so under campaign finance rules, a favor is not a favor, it must be written down and documented, all right? If they're going to print these cards to you and hand the box over, they need to tell you what they would charge if you were just walking in off the street. They can't cut you a deal, it's gotta be fair market. So if they have a price sheet, they need to tell you it's $50 for these 5,000 cards. Okay, I'm gonna write that down, thank you. All right, so even as a candidate, if you, there, there are certain, it's just kind of common sense. If you're going to go out and spend $2,000 in office supplies for your campaign headquarters, then you need to write that down as an in-kind contribution. If you're going to use a computer for your campaign uh, exclusively, 
then that's an in-kind contribution. If it's your personal computer and you're just typing away on it, that's not necessarily, you know, you're using it for campaign and personal use, that's not necessarily an in-kind contribution. All right, so if you get confused, call and ask me, call and ask the county clerk, the election division, and we'll help you figure that situation out, okay? That's always the best question. Uh, one final thing, going back to what we were talking about, about actually getting on the ballot earlier, correct me if I'm wrong, but state assembly, uh, house and state assembly candidates as well as the statewide offices still have to file an ethics form? Yes, that, thank you. Believe it or not, these people actually claim to have ethics. Uh, yes, that is important. There's also one thing before I get to the ethics forms. There's one other form that I totally spaced on. I thank you for bringing that up. The uh, candidates for state legislative offices used to have to file at the state and the county level. You don't have to do that anymore. You just file with the IED. So if anyone's told you that you have to file it both, uh, it used to be called a courtesy copy to the county clerk. You don't do that anymore. That went away this year. There are statement of economic interests for pretty much every race other than local, local races. So if you're running for state legislative office, you go to the House clerk or the Senate clerk and you get the statement of economic interest forms. Okay, those are due by July, June 30th with the CAN, the CAN 23s. I will have a stack of those forms for state candidates at the state convention, okay? Congressional and, and Senate candidates on the federal level fill out an online form which is, uh, there is a link to it on the resources page. Statewide offices for state offices like Attorney General, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, you have to file your forms online and that includes the statement of economic interest. State legislative candidates, your economic interest forms are not online. All right, so it's depending on what your race. Ask me about the economic interest forms, and we'll work something out. We have until June June thirtieth to turn those in. And usually, I just get a stack of them at the state convention, and I walk them over for you and take care of that in the can twenty threes. The last form that I didn't talk about there is probably the most important, and that's the VRG seven, the voter registration form. I have seen over the last three years so many libertarian candidates run their campaign by going to libertarian events exclusively. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you've got their votes. All right? Your most important goal as a candidate is to go out into the world, into your personal circles, and register new people to vote, and take Republican and Democrat votes, and to take independent votes, and get them to vote for you. You're the face of the libertarian message, and it's up to you to go out and talk about that message and to bring new people into the political system. And wherever you go, even if it's to the grocery store, you should have a VRG7 in your back pocket. Because your goal is to register new people to vote and get them involved in the process. Libertarians are going to win by making sure that they have those forms filled out. Make sure you read the rules, because if you take their form, you've got a deadline to turn those in, and it's. You know, you're taking on a responsibility, so if somebody doesn't show up on election day and say, I thought I turned that in, but that is the most important form out of all of these, is going out and talking to voters and getting new people involved in the process and voting a different way. So I want to thank you all. If you have any questions, I'll be around all day. You have my phone number, my email, my Facebook. I'm, I'm, I'm around. So let me know if you have any more questions or uh, need anything else. I thank you guys. Can I point one thing out real quickly? Although Chris has graciously offered his time and his information to everybody, please remember he's an employee of the uh, State Central Committee and has responsibilities to us and job duties and things he has to do. If you have a question, try to find the answer for it yourself. Personal responsibility before calling Chris. And if you call him and leave him and uh, ask him a question and he doesn't get back to you immediately, don't start complaining because he's mile and they have a hundred candidates he's trying to help this fall and and it's going to be spread pretty thin between all the different races we have gone on so please try to get your issues resolved yourself if you can and if you can't you could ask with your district rep on the central central committee your county chair uh, call one of the officers before you bother chris with something that is 
something that could probably be answered pretty easily. Appreciate your time, though.